Hey. How's it going? Good, how are you? <laughs> I'm well, thanks. So I could just jump around then with the uh, roles in your career and everything. Sure, yeah, do what you do. Do your thing. I saw some of your other stuff. It looks really good. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> From the beginning, I know uh, in terms of professional acting, did everything start with uh, playing, uh, you were in a theater production of uh, in, the, in the Woods while you were still in college? Oh my gosh, you've done your research. Um, <laughs> that was one of my, you know, first productions. I um, I started doing theater at a very young age, not professional theater, but theater for school, um, because I think that's great training. I did a lot of Shakespeare um, and a lot of different musicals. And yeah, I actually did Into the Woods twice. And I did it my senior year in high school and played the witch. And then what was really bizarre was then I did it the very next year in college at NYU and played um, Rapunzel, who's the daughter, um, as we all know. But it was kind of funny to go, you know, up in age one year, but, you know, playing, going from playing the mom to the daughter was mm -hmm. a lot of fun. Was there ever any aspiration early on once things got going with your career that you wanted to move to L.A.? No, actually, I've never had that dream. I mean, I do think it would be easier to be a voice actor and be living in Los Angeles. I'm aware that there are a lot of strikes. You know, I wouldn't say strikes against the New York voice actor, but it's a lot harder for us. Um, if we aren't in Los Angeles, we have to kind of work, I don't know, three or four times harder than the, than Los Angeles. Not saying that they're not, I mean, they're great and they're working fantastical well, but we have to go above and beyond. We have to look for other opportunities. We have to, um, it's just a little, it's a little more challenging because it's not the first place you think of for voiceover. It's the second or the third, you know? Are you in SAG though? Yes, I'm in um, SAG after I'm also in um, I'm actually FICOR, which means I can work union yeah. and non union. Uh, but I started out SAG after obviously I was also in AGVA, which is the uh, American Guild of Variety Artists, because I did a show off Broadway that was part of that. And I'm also in equity, which is the um, Actors Equity Association, which is the stage union. So I'm familiar with the unions. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been a part of of all of them at some point. Mm -hmm. Not all of them. I haven't been in the musicians union or the, you know, there's yeah. a bunch of other ones, you know, on Broadway, even IATSE, that's a really strong union. That's the stage hands union. It's like oh. one of the best unions to be in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that is one thing I always like asking them. Um, is there any kind of special story of how you got in the SAG? Um, oh my gosh. I don't know if I remember. I did several jobs. Um, two of them were cast recordings. Um, and then, so I think I actually got my, um, after card through, I cast recordings on um, Broadway and off Broadway, um, shows. And I think Mattel might've been the one that, that turned me union. I, I know I should remember that, but I don't, um, such a long time ago. I think I did a toy for Mattel. I remember doing at least two different ones, um, and I think that was the job that turned me union, but I don't remember. Equity was a bigger deal for me, to be honest, because, you know, I had two life goals, being on Broadway and being the voice of a cartoon. And I wanted Broadway first and I wanted it more. So my focus was getting into equity and then getting into sag -Aftra. And that's actually exactly how it happened. It doesn't always come out how you plan, but when it does, you feel really lucky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so I know in terms of voiceover, um, it was uh, Ultraman Tiger that started. I mean, I mean, Ultraman Tiga was my first. Like, yeah, you did your research. <laughs> I'm impressed. That was my very first animated. Well, not animated. It was live action. Right. My first uh, voiceover. Yeah. I think I had done a couple of radio ads first for shows that I was in, you know, mm -hmm. Um, I think I did one for Shout the Mod Musical. Um, but as far as like, you know, voice acting in the um, other realms, that was the first thing I did. Mm -hmm. Ultraman Tiga. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I would think anime, one of the first things had to be uh, Outlanders. I don't remember. That's what's terrible. <laughs> um, I remember one of the first things being... Um, 
for an, for anime, I think one of the first things was actually a guest spot on Pokemon is this bully character, which I should remember his name, but I don't. <laughs> um, it was just a guest spot. And then I think from there, I got, um, I think after that, I should remember the order of things, but I don't. <laughs> I think was Lyserg was next. Okay. Um, yeah. And Shaman King. And I think next came Nurse Joy and Mai together. Mm -hmm. I think that's the order, but, you know, fans sometimes know things even better than me. Yeah. And that's the scary part. <laughs> <laughs> and considering your experience up until that point, did you take the dubbing easier or was it still hard to get used to? It, I fell right into it. And I think it's because people who have musical training, um, it's easier. I think it's easier for some of us because uh, it's rhythmic, right. you know, and, you know, I studied music from a very young age. And so you sort of, it's it's sort of easier to feel the tempo and the musicality of it. And every style, every studio has a style of adapters and every adapter has a different language of what they use, a dash or a period or two periods. You know, different things mean different things at different studios. And so that's the hardest thing as a dubber is moving around from different adapters and different studios and remembering, oh, okay, here this means this, but here this means this, that kind of thing. Yeah. Just have to make sure you know what world you're in when you're in the booth working on it, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And speaking of uh, Lizer, um, I have also found that um, talking to voice actresses who do multitudes of boy voices, they kind of all have their own different thing they do for it sometimes. Is there something that you do specifically for boy voices? It's, that's a great question. I have a different thing that I do for each character, depending on their personality type, depending on how they are described. So sometimes they are just, I've done prelay, a lot of prelay as boys, not just dubbing. So it depends on, you know, if the character is supposed to be scrappy and bullyish, I'm going to put more texture or powerful, more texture or more playful, more texture. If they're, you know, on the nerdier side or on the quieter side, I'm going to put less texture and a little bit more um, movement, like marbles in my mouth. Um, I might pitch it up a little bit more. I might um, put it a little bit more on my mask. So there's like a whole variety of a fluctuation of boy character types that I convey. And, you know, then there's just like the heroic, you know, low hero. And that one is like, you know, more, you know, gravelly and grit than then you know more like the batman version of little boy um so it kind of runs the gamut but one thing that i tell people a great way to get in this inside the mind of a child you know depending how young you're getting the younger you're getting the more over articulation there tends to be because we're learning how to speak mm -hmm. you know the younger you are the more you're actually still learning so like when a when a baby is walking you'll notice that they kind of hit the floor really hard because they don't actually know where the floor is and so sometimes they straighten your leg before it hits the floor it's and so like when a baby is learning to speak or when they're getting when they're getting older and they're becoming a toddler and then becoming a child um they're trying to learn how to move the mouth correctly and so sometimes i'll say like putting a certain amount of like marbles in your mouth. You're not actually doing it because you could choke to death, but <laughs> it's like, how many mar marbles am I trying to get around? And that will kind of add to the babyish quality if the, if the character's younger. So that's a little trick that I taught myself years ago. And then I like to, you know, if I'm trying to help someone create that sound, that's one of the tips that I'd give. Yeah. Yeah. Overcompensating when you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And speaking of a uh, shaman King with Lizer gum, what were your thoughts on the newer series and how dark things got with his character? And I mean, I was psyched, you know, like, I mean, I'll, I'll go wherever, wherever the story takes me. Like I'm a team player. Um, I tell, you know, I do coach sometimes and I, I tell my students like, check your ego at the door, like come in with ideas, but check your ego at the door because your idea is not necessarily going to be the producer's idea or the director's idea. So you have to be ready to change at a moment's notice. And I also say, don't get locked in an idea. Don't get locked in a read because the, the more strict you are about this is the only way it can be done. Mm -hmm. You will fail because you have to be able to be flexible, you know, walk in the door, check your ego 
as you're coming in and be um be open, you know, be open to what they have to say. And as long as you're able to take direction, that's how you succeed. And that's how you continue working because those directors want to work with you again. They know, you know, this person's not going to be a diva and this person's not going to get locked in a read or locked in an idea. And I can really play with them and I can mold them, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of the director's ideas and your ideas coming together. Yeah. That's what makes the perfect, you know, the best types of performances. Mm -hmm. What uh, speaking on Miser again, um, just because I'm a big fan of his character and everything. Uh, what what uh, aspects of him could you relate the most to? I mean, the friendship, the deep ties, the loyalty, and then like, you know, it was interesting because when we um when we when we decided to do, you know, when they asked me to do the new one, I came to them ahead of time and I said, "Hey, this is exciting. I'm very excited to do this, but uh." what do you want to do? Do you want to do what we did before? Or do you want to give him, you know, a British accent or, oh. you know, what? And so they decided like, let's keep it for what the fans want and what the fans are used to. Let's keep it the way it was. Cause I did say to them, Hey, I'm open to changing it. I'm open to trying it the way that it was initially intended. Um, and I think the reason why it wasn't done that way is because they hadn't, Japan hadn't given them all the storyline ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So they only could work with what they had. And so they had made one of the other characters British. And then they were like, oops, you know, I can't, we can't do that now with this character. And so they just were like, just don't do it. Um, so I would have loved to have added that layer, but I was also excited to explore and go back to what I knew. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I thought you might find that interesting since you are a, a fan of the character. Yeah. 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 And I just thought that, uh, the scene where he quickly makes work of the uh, Egyptian fighters and he's crying and telling Yo that, you know, when he's brainwashed and he's like, um, you know, kindness isn't going to save anything. Um, I thought that you did a really great job at that. Oh, thank you so much. You know, as an actor, most of us love to dig deep. You know, I tell people there are different kinds of actors and there's different ideas of what acting is. Some people say acting is reacting. That's so much a part of it listening right when we're listening when we're in the booth by ourselves we're not always able to listen to what the performance is so we really have to look at the context of what's being said before but also um so acting is reacting but acting is also some people think it's showing okay yeah. that's part of it but it's feeling because when you feel you're showing already mm -hmm. you know and and Again, there's two there's two ideas of thoughts. There's actually way more than that. But like if you're doing a Broadway show and you're doing eight shows a week, you have to rely on the technique because if your character's breaking down and sobbing, you know, in the middle of uh, act two, scene one every night, chances are you're going to get there six times out of the week. But maybe the other two, you're not quite going to get there. So you've got to rely on your technique. So maybe you can always get there by by thinking about putting yourself in that position or thinking of a, of a friend of yours or a child being in that position so you can get there from the what I call the inside out. But twice a week, that's not working for you. Mm -hmm. So you got to go to your second toolbox and go, okay, if I make the sounds that I'm supposed to make, then I'm the feeling might come after. So everybody works differently, you know, but it's important to note that some of the best acting, in, in, in my opinion, most of the best acting is feeling. And even when I'm playing a comedic character on stage or, or in a show, um, I'm feeling the sorrow of that comedic character just as deeply and heavily as I'm feeling the sorrow of a dramatic character. Mm -hmm. So that's the trick is like, you're not playing the joke. You're not playing the effect of what they're hearing. You're playing what that character feels in that moment. And if you play that honestly, it's going to come across that way. Right. You know? What do you think in terms of anime? What do you think the darkest headspace you've had to go for a character is? Uh, you know, I can't recall necessarily the darkest in anime. There's been a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the darkest uh, spaces I had to go to was for this, um, gosh, I hope I remember the name of it, White Day. It was a video game. And my character, I don't want to like ruin anything or there any spoilers, but there's a scene where she's caught in a fire, you know, and she's screaming for help for her mom. And it's like the characters, I, 
ambiguous their their you know their intentions and so i kind of already knew all of that but then the characters dying in a fire and asking help from their mom and that scene killed me you know like i remember actually you know really crying like i should be right but also kind of feeling a little stuck in that moment because it was just so thinking about i mean just i was a mother at that point you know what i mean and so it was like oh like i can't i can't go there this is this is too difficult to imagine a child being in this position so it was very easy for me to go there emotionally and what part of the technique is is how do you get out of that as fast as you got into it oh the next cue you're in another scene and you're happy now right. you know what i mean and i would i think that was one of the most difficult transition moments from a deep scene i had to ask the director for a minute i was like can i just have a minute like i just i don't know why but that hit me really hard so i took a minute and then we went on to the next beat. But um, that was probably one of the darkest moments I've had to play. Okay. Yeah. And then this is a more of a technical question. Um, it's a great question. I've never been asked that before. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, technically speaking, um, with Pokemon, what was the case where you had to alter your voice the most for the Ooh, Pokemon? <laughs> okay. Well, gosh, I'm probably going to have to give a couple examples, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, Tapu Koko is a, is one, but that's comes from like this sound that I created as a child, um, where I could vibrate my soft palette. Um, so I could create like multi-tones at the same time. And I used to play around a lot with my voice when I was younger and I was always creating new characters. You know, even when I was like three years old, I had like a roster of characters I had created on my own. Um, and so this was a sound that I had created and I thought one day this will come in handy. This will be used for something. And then I was cast as Tapu Koko and it, that became a part of it. But one of the other ones, this is funny. Um, so I was cast as Treb Trubbish and then um, the director at that point said, now you're going to play Garboder. I was surprised. Now I was not scared. I was not worried. I was surprised because I was like, thank you for giving me this challenge. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't think you would give me this challenge, but guess what? I'm going to take it. And I'm going to run with it because, you know, we went in a little bit different direction. And then in Japanese, it's a little more tinny. It's a little more forward. It's a little more like silly upper register, but we wanted to go for the big sound, the big, like, and then also the retching. I don't know if you, if anybody listening has noticed, but we retch a lot as Garboder. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of actual vomit sounds, which I have so much fun with. I have to say, um, that's a really big, um, transformation one. There've been so many, all the Ori Oricorios sing differently. Yeah. So it was super fun coming up with those melodies together because we did not take the Japanese ones. Some of them there was based on that, but some of them didn't work for different reasons. Sometimes you have to change things. Um, but creating those four different types, that was also fun. So I don't know, there's been a bunch. Livani is is wild. It's got a yodel in the middle of it. Um, I really enjoyed creating that one as well. But what a fun, fun question. Yeah. What about all the um the nuances between what you did with the um Eevee and Eevee, all of Eevee's evolutions? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, some of that, again, was based on the Japanese and some of it was based on recognizing that some of the Japanese voices, we felt maybe some of them are a little too similar. So we had to separate them a little bit more. Right. Um, you know, Sylveon is is higher and breathier and more tender and um, sweet sounding. And then Flareon has kind of got the bubble and can be rough and low too. Um, and then Eevee's got the texture and the scrap, except for, you know, regular Eevee has a little bit less of that. And then Sandy the Eevee has more and there's just a, a little bit more um, range, lower range with that character. Um, so it was really fun developing those. And then in Glaceon and Espeon, I don't get to do as often, but um, so whenever I'm working on that, I'm, I'm kind of refining those as well because they just don't show up as much, you know, mm. but yeah, it's been <laughs> a lot of fun. Yeah. I had to do them all at once for a special. I forget the name of it. Moonlight something. Ah, someone out there is remembering it. And so that was all done like in one day, like, okay, you're going to do all this. And I was like, whoa, you know? And so as they came back, I was able to, to develop them even more. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. It does also sound like uh, well, well, the Fed is maybe kind of more like a boy voice beginning, like placement. You know, it's easier. Like I started out doing definitely much more of a voice match to Casey. Um, but I do a lot of voice matches for her and she's awesome. And I love her. And she was very happy that I was taking over for her, for a bunch of her roles when she retired. Um, but her, her voice, I was a natural choice because we have a lot of similarities in our, in our just natural voice box. Mm -hmm. But then um, there are some differences. And her, one of her differences is she's got this amazing, like meaty texture in the middle of her voice. It's just like this, I'll call it meat because uh, is smoke and meat is, uh, you know, it's, it's just a different sound. There's different levels of meat, I'll call it. Um, but anyway, Waba Fett had so much meat in the middle that, and when I first started taking over, it was similar to like when I was working on Luffy and Lyserk, but even Luffy and Lyserk was, wasn't as hard as, as Waba Fett, because at least it was coming from me based on the Japanese inspiration, but also from me. Um, and here I was doing, you know, an exact voice message match from English to English. Right. So that's different. I got to get it even better, you know? Um, so the, at the beginning, I was definitely doing a, a much closer voice match to Waba Fett. And then slowly it morphed into my version of Waba Fett, which is, uh, has a touch more of what I'll call the smoke texture than the meat texture. Um, and that's for longevity purposes. Um, because that that's one of the voices that kind of kills me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't do it for too long. And so when we do episodes, what we do is we keep Waba Fett for last. Or we'll just do a whole session with Waba Fett, but a shorter one. So, um, you know, I'll, I start human. Then I go high, high, clear creature. And then we go more texture, lower, more texture, lower. You know, and then that's how, how we how we run it so sometimes she'll say we're doing these seven characters today and i'll be like okay what's awesome is it's lisa ortiz and she'll say well what order do you want to go in which makes me love her so much <laughs> because that's just first of all smart mm -hmm. you want to blow your actor out on in the first 10 minutes of the of the scene she's not being stubborn about the order of things right we do have to go in the order of the episodes but we can go from the character that i want to do first to the character that i want to do last and that's very helpful for vocal placement um because also you don't want to do texture and then smooth like that character that has the smoothest pinchiest voice you don't want to do that after you did the character with all the texture because it's harder you can do it and i've done it many 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 times but it's harder you know and it's less precise that way it, it definitely ends up being better the other way around if yeah. that makes any sense well, that's my saying of the day if that makes any sense <laughs> <laughs> well speaking about lighter voice characters i don't even know if you can there's much of a story about it but probably for me my favorite role of yours is um hilda in the shadow hearts video game oh my gosh are you serious yeah oh i love that i love that you know that and remember that and there's three different voices in that so yeah, which right. one did you like i think the one where she has the heart-shaped mask is the coolest that, 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 that's when she's so the, i'm the toughest like that's the closest to my voice yeah <laughs> you know, she's like she's so she's sort of like you know sexy but fierce yep. right and then there's the one where she's like you know and then i don't even remember that the third one was at yeah, this point I think it's just the normal the normal voice yeah there's like three versions of her that was fun yep. that was a really fun job <laughs> yeah i loved doing that yeah so I know back to the timeline um, early on, um, you were in things like Samurai Deeper, Kyo. Yeah. Uh, Gao. I worked a lot at NYAV. It was so much fun. You know, there was a crew there and just, you know, um, Dan Green was directing, Sean Shemmel was directing, Michael Sinter Nicholas was directing. So I was working with all three of them um, on various things and just having the time of my life, you mm -hmm. know. Speaking of Michael, that is uh, one thing I've always asked uh New York based voice actors, they all kind of have a Michael Center Nicholas story. <laughs> oh, Michael's the best. I mean, I, uh, what, what is a Michael Center Nicholas story? I remember actually at Christmas time, wrapping presents, helping him wrap, like, uh, they were really nice presents. I don't know what they were. They were like a cube, and they were some like really piece of electronic equipment that was very expensive that he bought for all of his directors. 
as a gift for all the amazing work that they were doing. And it just so happened that they arrived like when I was there and I just finished a session. He's like, do you want to help wrap the, uh, wrap the Christmas presents? And I was like, yes, I do. So we were just like hanging out, wrapping a present for, I think that was when Mark DeRazon was working there as well. Oh, so yeah. I don't, I don't know that if Mark and Sean overlapped, I think Sean left and Mark kind of was the person that, but honestly, I, I don't remember. So I don't know if I, if I wrapped two presents or three, but um, yeah, I mean, it's like you work with people enough, you, they become family. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I know that you do cons regularly with a lot of the cast. Yeah. Well that just started really. I mean, I usually was just there with maybe just me. And now it's like, we're starting to see, um, you know, I'll be there with Eric or there with Eric and Dan or there with Eric, Dan and Lisa, or, you know, I even finally got to meet Megan, which is insane that we hadn't met before because we were even in a show together before she moved to Los Angeles. Yep. But anyway, I heard amazing things about her. Like so many people love Megan. And so we did a con together last November and um had a great time we just totally clicked we had met online before obviously for years we were facebook friends and then um and instagram friends but then she came up with this brilliant idea to do an americare um fundraiser with all the nurse joys oh yeah and she and i were on facetime like talking about oh, how can we do this and so we had collaborated before we met in person, but she's freaking awesome. I love yeah. Megan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like, oh, I found like a long lost friend. Like you were always there, but we just never knew each other. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And when you've gotten in dubs of shows like um, My Senpai is Annoying and Battle in Five Seconds, were that just for those from like connections that you had in LA? Um. Well, how did I? Well, I, I Battle Game in Five Seconds was an offer. I'll be honest. That was an offer. Um, my senpai annoying my senpai is annoying was an audition um and it was yeah that was from an audition so yeah okay was that yeah <laughs> yeah all the all the funimation shows were auditions okay yeah well going back to your um big characters in anime who do you think that you personally relate the most to oh my goodness I mean, it depends. There, there are aspects of each of them that, that speak to me. Um, Luffy's goofiness. I mean, my sense of humor is pretty goofy. I mean, I, and it, my, his exuberance, Bianca also Bianca from, um, Pokemon is just kind of always a little bit singing. That's kind of like me a little bit. There's always a little singing in my, uh, in my life. Um, and also she's just kind of fun and charismatic and you know I like to be I like to enjoy life I'm not one of those people who sits around sulking in the corner or um is angry all the time I really try and embrace each moment and have the most fun and so Bianca kind of reminds me of that I'm not as like I'm not a stalker like her <laughs> <laughs> but um she's she, I relate to her and I mean my character cheese in uh Boy, girl, dog, cat, mouse, cheese. The theatricality of her, which is not an anime, um, reminds me of of the theatricality that I can be. I can tone it down, but also if you ask me to tone it up, you know, I will show up full in full force, just like cheese does mm -hmm. every minute of every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you have a personal favorite Pokemon in terms of who you've played? Um, I do love Sandy the Eevee. I know it's an obvious answer, but like you know, you, you love a lot of time, the ones that you spend more time with like Pancham, you know, um, I have special, I have a special connection to a lot of them. Sobble. I love just because you just like, Oh, so sweet. And you just feel so bad for him. And then when we were working on Drizzile, I have to say emo, I mean, just, <laughs> you know, it just, Lisa and I were laughing a lot because it was just so, it just reminded me of like an emo teenager and that's really what we based it on and um i think when you listen to the performance you'll chuckle a bit because that it, we, we were just really spot on with the uh, you know grabbing from current society and bringing it in right it was a lot of fun mm -hmm. yeah what about in terms of your characters in Yu-Gi-Oh? well i mean akiza is special to me because she was all mine you mm -hmm. know what i mean 
um, obviously based on the Japanese, but, um, and what's interesting about Akiza was if you listen to the first couple of episodes, which I haven't done and I should really do it. I remember starting out a bit higher in my register and then, um, Darren Dunstan going, let's bring her down a little bit. Let's make her a little bit more you, Erica. Let's like, let's bring more of you into her. So there's like, it's, it's a lot of me, you know? And, um, I really, and he was like, you're a little bit more of a, of a woman. Like she's, she's a girl, but she's also, she's strong. And like, so I really enjoyed the process of kind of making those changes at the beginning. If you listen to the Simpsons and you listen to um, Homer, he's completely different right. from season one to even, I think season two or three, um, Akiza went through a little bit of a shift at the beginning. And then when we really found her, it was great. You know, that, that role meant a lot to me. And what was really funny about that role was I didn't know it was going to be a big part. I thought she was going to have like a two or three or three uh -oh. character arc battle arc. And she was going away. I think it wasn't until like the sixth episode that I was like, wait a minute, is she part of the main cast? Like she's sticking around. And they were like, yeah, yeah, she's sticking around. And I was like, well, happy surprise to me because I had no idea. So it was like, a you know, then there was like an, the extra gift of she's not going anywhere, mm -hmm. you know, um, and people, what's interesting is Blaze the Cat and Akiza, people talk about those two characters to me. Fans talk to me all the time about these two and they, they bring a lot of parallels. They're not comparing them, but I am in my head when they talk about them um, because they were both like the first um you know, fierce and strong warriors and they won, you know, and they, and they were you know, emotional. They had something, a journey that they needed to go to go through. And um, so in certain ways, you know, a lot of my fans and particularly the females really relate to those characters. And they're like, yes, they were waiting for that type of character to come along. So they were excited when it, when it finally did. That mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah. Did you tend to, uh, consume much of the anime that you also act in or that's a great question um i would usually try back in the day and watch like the first one to three episodes of everything just so i could get a sense of what the show was and what it felt like you know more like research on the show than than, than research on myself not because i was ever cringe i know some people are like i hate you know for me i make the choice and once it's done it's gone. I'm not second guessing because second guessing is just terrible. It's a terrible idea. Don't do it. Make your choice. Don't second guess it. You know, if the director wants something else, obviously, or another take, you go for it. But you are, as actors, we are interpreters. We are there to interpret the material. We are there to not give a neutral feeling about it, to make a choice and um, go with it. So to answer your question, some, and then when my kids were born and as they got older, I ended up listening back because they discovered things. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So I'd be yeah. like straightening my hair in the other room or something like the house that we were at before this, when we were renting and the bathroom was like right next to the living room. So I'd be like getting ready in the morning as my son would watch his morning cartoons. And sometimes he was watching Pokemon and sometimes he was watching Yu-Gi-Oh and he'd be like, mom, mom, you know, is that you? Like, I think that's you. Like he'd be trying to find out which characters were yeah. me and which characters weren't. It was so cute. And so like 80% of the time he'd get it right. <laughs> you know, 20% of the time I'd be like, no, nope, that's not me. He'd be like, really? It sounds like you. You know, he could kind of sometimes figure it out. And sometimes he'd miss one. I'd be like, that's mommy. And he'd be like, really? You know, um, so that was really sweet is to come yeah. back and listen to it with your kids. Like, that's special, you know? Mm. So rediscovering a lot of it now because of the kids. And my son watched the, I had two or three DVDs of the four kids version of One Piece. He watched it and he loved it because he was a kid. He didn't know the original. He didn't have anything to compare it to. He absolutely loved it and he wanted more. And my husband was like, hell no, because it was like $150 for the next DVD. So the next thing I know, he's watching the Funimation version. I walk in the room and he's like, he looks at me like I'm going to be mad at him. He's like, mom, I'm sorry. And I'm like, I don't care. I, I love that you're watching it. Like, that's the whole point. Mm -hmm. 
you can transition. A lot of people watched both. A lot of people loved both because one was one was for how we had to listen to standards and practices. Not we. I didn't have anything to do with it. I'm just an actor. But S and P was really strict. So we had to they had to adhere to those rules. And so then when the new version came out, that was a little bit more a lot more, you know, uh, what do you what do you say? Um true to the source material um people a lot of people made the transition and watched both you know so it's like fans come up to me colleen has signed a pop and then i sign it or i sign a poster and they're like i'm gonna get colleen to sign this so it's a it's a beautiful thing it's a really interesting and fun thing to be the first second third fourth fifth sixth seventh eighth i think i was the ninth emma frost um (laughs) and it's like i look at it this way like all of those characters are a part of me and I, I, I own a small part of them, but the artist and the writer owns it and I'm leasing it. And it, and when it goes to someone else or, you know, when I give it to someone else um, or something comes to me, it's always still a part of the other person. It's always a part of you, um, but you don't own it. You know, it's a, it's, it's a part of you and it will always be a part of you. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We haven't talked about Tokyo Mew Mew yet. Oh, Tokyo Mew Mew. What do you want to what do you want to hear about it? Do you, do you know if you're coming back for? Bella? Oh, you know what? I wouldn't be allowed to say oh, okay. if I knew Um, if that makes any sense. Right. Yeah. Again, that's my phrase of the day. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> was uh, Bridget or Lettuce someone that you could easily relate to? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's an interesting journey as a female in society <laughs> going through, you know, you have a lot of different influences in life and you have some people saying, keep your head down, you know, do this. Some people saying, lift your head up and do this. Some people saying, make your voice heard. Some people say, blend in. Some people are saying, um, be demure some people are saying hell no you know and it's like you're hearing and i know that males get this too you know we all are thrown archetypes at us as humans and we are are interested in like that's what makes us complex beings is that what are we listening to what are we not listening to when are we listening to it um and how does it all come together to form our personality you know and so i would say in my twenties, I was always fun and kooky and weird and silly and confident, always confident, but also, you know, trying to understand when to keep quiet, when to speak out something that I'm still cognizant of. But I think in my, in my earlier years, I was even more cognizant of it. And I kind of probably listened to it too much, you know, Mm -hmm. and as you grow and you mature as a person, or as a woman, um, you start to recognize that there are times when you should not be quiet. <laughs> and there are a lot of times where you need to speak out. You need to speak up. You need to be strong. You need to be. And so the parts of Bridget that I related to, you know, there was a lot of me in that, you know, um, the parts of me who didn't want to step on people's toes. I had a terrible experience. I'm not going to, I had a terrible experience once in the theater. I was doing a production of um, West Side Story. I'm not going to say where. Mm -hmm. Um, I was 17. Uh, I was the youngest cast member. It was a professional production. Um, I was understudying Maria because at the time, you know, Caucasians would do that. And then I was also the, um, the pit singer who sings or otherwise known as the somewhere ballet vocalist. And this was my first professional experience. And I was also, so I was understudying also the dance scenes and stuff like that. So they had like a, you know, a huge performance space. And there was this, um, I don't know what you call it, like platform where we were all dancing. And then there was like a step down, maybe like three inches where you weren't dancing. Um, and I tried to stay on off of that platform. I tried to feel my place as an understudy it's really hard. I'm like, I have to learn everything that everyone else is doing, but I can't show up. I can't be present. I, 
have to lurk in the background and just like almost be like a ninja. Like nobody knows I'm here kind of thing. Um, don't take up space, that kind of thing. And we had just finished dancing. I was exhausted. I, I was having a hard time catching my breath, to be honest. And so I yawned, you know, and the director's giving notes. And I was like, you know, like I was just like really trying to get it. And he was like, excuse me. <laughs> Am I boring you? You know, just like called me out in front of all these professional actors, made a total fool of me, you know, and I thought to myself, what a dick, you yeah. know, but I was, but I was overcome with emotion. Like I just wanted to crawl into a corner and just disappear. I was so humiliated, so embarrassed and so sad. He made me so sad. And, um, after that moment, I went, you know, after I got through that day and that week, I thought, I'm never going to let anyone treat me like that again. But I let him. I let that person treat me like that. I didn't stand up for myself and say, I actually needed oxygen so you can shove it. Or, you know, I could have even said it in a respectful way, but I was so taken aback because he had all this power and I had none. And right. he knew that, you know, and he shouldn't have done that. And after that experience, I went, I started to become less of a Bridget. You know what I mean? And I went, yeah, I'm never going to let someone talk to me like that again. I'm never going to, uh, that's not okay. And I don't want to work for somebody like that, right. you know? And so it's interesting how you can draw from your own life and bring it into the life of your character and remember those moments where like when, when Bridget breaks out, and stands up for herself. I'm thinking about moments like that where I was like, didn't do what I should have, or when I learned to finally do it. Mm -hmm. You know, this might be obvious too, but was it um, situations like that when it came to live action acting that made you want to focus more on voiceover because of there's no like drama with it for the most part? <laughs> oh, you. I'm sorry. Repeat the question. I'm 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 a little bit confused about oh, it. Oh, did you want to like? Was there something that happened related to that, similar to that, that made you want to focus? Oh, more? you mean like I just didn't want to experience that again? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean I, like I said, I had these two life goals, and I was like, I'm not going to stop until I get them. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. It's funny because you know some children know what they want to do immediately. My brother and my sister didn't have that same thing. They had incredible intelligence you know like that i didn't have i had a different kind of i had emotional intelligence and i was very smart but um i wasn't as book smart as they were i had to work really really hard to to um to get an honor society i had to work really really hard to graduate with honors from myu and they just like had it naturally but what i had that they didn't have was drive um and n to know what i wanted and i felt bad for them and i think it's funny because you shouldn't know what you want to do when you're that young. But like, I had all this empathy, like, oh, they don't know what they want to do. Like how terrible, you know, but everybody finds that and discovers that at a different time. So it wasn't like one, the reason why I, um, what happened was I started doing readings, workshops, concept albums, and I stopped doing production. That means like eight, eight shows a week. So I, I started only doing the development side of theater because it was a better schedule for having the kids. And I realized I didn't have kids so that somebody else could put them to bed, mm -hmm. you know? And I was like, I, yeah, I'm w to each their own, whatever you want to do. But I was like, no, I'm going to voice acting is perfect for me, you know, because I could put my kids to bed every night. Yeah. You know, what greater gift Instead of just on Mondays, you know, that would have been ho horrible. I don't think I could have handled it. So when, when they go to college, um, I'll probably get back on the stage as well. I don't really know if I'll have, it's okay. a different, if I'll, if I'll still have the, the energy, cause it's like the amount of energy that it takes to be a voice actor, to be a successful voice actor is a lot. It's a lot of work, but also to do stage acting is, e is even more because you have to memorize <laughs> yeah. you got to memorize your scenes you got to memorize your songs with our auditions you don't have to memorize mm -hmm. you know that's just one small thing but also staying physically active staying physically agile and all that other stuff yeah. 
but that's a it's a great question. Mm-hmm. But it was mostly because I I transitioned out of it not completely, but in the production realm, eight shows a week, because I wanted to be a like a full mother. You know, if I wanted to give, I wanted that time. Right. Maybe you'll agree with this. Um, probably my favorite term that I've heard from another uh, long running voice actor that they've said that anybody who wants to pursue voice acting specifically and make it be their life is like ice skating on saran wrap. (laughs) Who said that? I love it. Oh my gosh. I mean, I don't know if it's as dangerous as that, (laughs) but, um, it's certainly, there's certainly a lot of balance. You know what I mean? Um, it's, I think people think that you come to a certain point and then you're, you've, you've arrived. Right. right. And yeah. in some essence, yes. In some circles, yes. Right. Um, but if you truly love what you do, you're always going for the next thing. You're always trying the next thing. You're always like, okay, I've done this. Now I want to do this. Okay. I've done this. Now I want to try this, you know, and you have to maintain all those balls that you already have in the air. Then you got to add like two, three more as they come up. And so you just get more and more diversified, but you also get more and more busy. And the other thing people don't recognize is, you know, successful voice actors that work in multiple genres, right? Just not anime, but also prelay, but also video games, but also commercial, but also podcasts, right? We have to keep all those skills sharp and we also have to audition constantly so part a part-time job that we have is to audition Mm -hmm. so it's not unusual to spend you know anywhere from five to 20 hours a week auditioning if you really want to stay competitive and you and you want to stay working at all times so because I do somewhere between three and eight projects a week I'm working on um in order to keep that workflow going I've got to audition just as much as more than that right yeah yeah i think it is changing now too especially with people around my age or younger who want to become voice actors but um i would like to hope more people are realizing that you can't really make a living if you only want to do anime yeah i mean it depends i I mean you can if you're going to be an adapter too and maybe a director or if you're just going to do that and you're going to like get a certain amount of hours you know you can do that there was like a long period of time where I was, you know, only acting. Um, And, you know, I've been uh, consistently a voice actor for 20 years, but yeah, dubbing does pay less. And so it's, um, it's harder, but, you know, if you have relationships with studios and you can keep that workflow going, it's possible, but it's not easy to sustain. Yeah. It's not easy to, to sustain. It's not easy to, um, to ha- to have savings or to you know to grow the in the way that other people grow in their career, it's um there's uh, I guess more more ceilings mm-hmm. you know um to to hurdle over if that makes any sense yeah yeah so what kind of things uh recently like is there anything that's upcoming you can safely talk about that you're a part of um well we just started recording season three of Boy Girl Dog Cat Mouse Cheese. Um, It only took me like six months to learn how to say that. (laughs) (laughs) And I played two of the mains, um, Cheese and Cat, and then three ancillary slash guest characters that come and go. Um, Susie, um, Lila Bird, and the CEO. And I love all these characters so much. Like, I love the CEO. Like, I didn't know I would fall in love with this character so much. I mean, she's just such a piece of work. You know what I mean? That is currently out in in Europe. It's it's in um, it's in England, Scotland, Ireland, I believe. Um, f- and then the French version in France, and then also in Canada. So we're hoping that that gets finds an American audience soon because it's such a fantastic show, and people would just flip over it and love it. Um, working on a couple of video games NDA, working on a couple of series NDA, um, and a couple of pilots. Okay. So always like, I would say always eight to 12 projects at a time coming and going. And then these three will phase out and these four will come in or, and then sometimes you have jobs that are like one day, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) 
So um other I mean I'm always always working on Pokemon, but everything else is NDA right now. Okay. Yeah, sadly. I think. I'm sure as soon as we finish the interview, I'll be like, oh, there's two projects I could have talked about. Yeah. But well, since it is fitting for this time of year, I didn't uh I didn't, I didn't bring up uh when talking about Shaman Community, you also of course play um, um Matilda and she's the Halloween. Yeah, oh. yeah. We um we did tweak the voice and the character just a touch um which was fun but yes i loved playing her um and she was like on my demo for years because she's such a fun character and i think we called her maddie yeah yeah Yeah. and then now she's matilda so it's fun to see like the little changes that happened from the old version to the new version and i'm sure everybody noticed i know you noticed because you like lyserg that lyserg had green eyes in the original and blue eyes in the reboot yeah mm -hmm. which i like i like the change you know yep. but um i don't know maybe purists might not be so happy about that <laughs> <laughs> well my final question is always asking uh, what do you want your legacy to be ah oh wow what a great question i want my legacy to be that i was um prepared <laughs> um and fun and i checked my ego at the door i wasn't a diva and you know that i was loved and respected by my colleagues first and then my fans because i think that's really important and going into everything that i've done it's always been really important to me that that i keep my sense of self and that I never, you know, lose who I am in in the fame aspect, right? Um, and just that that I'm a person that that people enjoy working with and that I showed up on time and like I don't know, what would it say on my grave? Um <laughs> she showed up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um and you know, I hope that people remember and recognize that. Um, I was a part of so many wonderful projects and got to bring some characters to life. And then some characters, I got to further their story. Um, but wherever I got those characters on their journey, you know, it was just, it's always a complete pleasure. You mm -hmm. know, yeah. it's joy. Mm -hmm. I love it. That's why I'm still doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I just wanted to add, too, that I think one of the reasons why the Shadow Hearts game series stuck with me so much, not just because I love horror as a genre, but also because um, that the third game that you were, that you were part of came out when I was in uh, fourth grade. And um, I remember uh, that was one of the things that I primarily consumed when there was a, there was a normal night when, prior to that, uh, there was a normal night where I was out to eat with my parents at a local place close to our house. And then we were about to leave and then um, heavily armed SWAT policemen came in and told everybody to turn all the lights off and go into the two bathrooms because there was a guy who uh, shot and killed one or yeah, that he shot two people and one of them died and he was oh fleeing goodness. on foot and um, he crashed his car outside the restaurant and he was trying oh to my goodness. get inside. So everybody in the restaurant had to stay in the restaurant until probably one in the morning and then get individually escorted to our cars so that was one of the games yes, that is terrifying and you yeah. were playing that game like yeah. that was yeah so thank oh you for goodness. being part of that <laughs> oh my goodness what a horrible thing to live through and to but th thank goodness that you you and your family were okay that's mm. that's traumatic yeah. oh my goodness and sadly things haven't changed much on that front yeah but hopefully soon mm -hmm. yeah Oh, I just wanted to thank you for yeah being part of being of part course. of that. Yeah, thank you so much, and thank you so much for having me. This was you asked so many beautiful, wonderful questions that I've never been asked before. Oh, thank you. And I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed this time. So thank you. Yeah. Well, have a good rest of your day then. Thanks so much. You too. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Take so much. Take care, Chris. Bye. Okay. Bye.